Well, so many wonderful changes to the city of Perth here on the ground. It's a fabulous place to be these days, but apparently there are more plans for it to go further up into the sky. Christy Mueller has the report. Changes in the WA Planning Commission's multiple dwellings rule have caused unintended consequences. The changes have allowed developers to build multiple units in lower density areas, causing complaints about parking jams and the new units being out of character. You will get, the, the, I, I believe the complaints you're getting are um, due to um, the, the growth of the city, the growth of the metropolitan area. I, I just think that uh, Perth is, you know, when I came to Perth it had a population of about 1.1 million, you know, we're up to nearly 3 million people now. Bottom line, well, we're getting up to three million. The bottom line is, uh, the more people you get, um, the more uh, probably the more complaints you're going to get, because uh, it's taking longer to get from the outer suburbs, and maybe into the CBD or wherever they're going. Um, uh, so complaints, maybe complaints are a positive thing. It tells us that hey, something's working. WA has seen a strong and steady population growth. And with the prices of single property soaring, there's increased pressure for providing affordable accommodation. One of the pressures are is that we have now, uh, whilst we have been having sustained population growth, we now have a quite a diversified population. Uh, and also they're looking for diversified housing products, not just the traditional four by two. There's a lot more demand at the whole range of of age scales for one and two bedroom and three bedroom developments from apartments down to perhaps what we would call townhouses and also they're really making a decision that they want to live closer to amenities such as uh, their employment, schools, uh, public transport and that type of, uh, those type of um, elements that are becoming more important today than perhaps they were 10 to 20 years ago. The development of multiple dwellings will help address Perth's urban sprawl issue. The shift to apartment living will provide more variety in accommodation and access to amenities. How, does it, uh, how do you think it will affect urban sprawl? The bottom line is I think it will alleviate urban sprawl because what you're doing is you're not putting uh, single families into single houses which has certainly created urban sprawl. What we're doing now is we're around train stations and around bus stations and those sort of things. Um, the government is encouraging um, unit development um, very, very much. Perth has one of the fastest growing urban populations in Australia. Some say it's time for us to embrace multiple dwellings as a solution and not a problem. Well, uh, we, we are uh, coming off the back of what was probably called a big country town. We are now a very vibrant, internationally recognised city and we want to produce the population within the city, within the CBD and those areas. I mean, we're 1.8 square kilometres, we're not terribly big, but we want to create a population in the city that, that reflects the vibrancy that we're looking to, to capture. Uh, multiple dwelling allows more consolidation in areas where the perhaps the housing stock is changing anyway, and it's old stock, I'm not talking about heritage stock, I'm talking about older stock. Uh, which is perhaps no longer appropriate for either the person living in it or future populations. And also, <clears throat> there is a greater demand for housing choice by not only younger people, but also perhaps older people who wish to downsize, but stay in their areas where their friends and uh, other social and um, medical type contacts are. Uh, we're getting planning applications coming in every month. and. You know, for 100, 150, 300 units. Um, in fact, probably in the last two planning meetings, we would have ticked off in the vicinity of nearly half a billion dollars worth of units just in the CBD. This has been Christy Muller for Undercurrent. Oh yes, the Christmas decorations are up in the city. Not too many more weekends to go now. Ooh, that's a little bit scary. Well, next up, the gentlemen from the CEC are back. Stay tuned for some more of their enlightenment. CEC report from Europe, growing support for new just economic order. Now, Robert, you were a part of an international conference, the 30th anniversary conference of our affiliate organisation in Europe, the Schiller Institute. 
And this is a part of a series of conferences dedicated to creating a new paradigm for the survival of civilization. Uh, this particular conference was headlined the New Silk Road and China's Lunar Program, Mankind is the Only Creative Species. We read out a part of the resolution that was passed yep. at that conference unanimously, which called upon the great nations to work together to combat the triple threat that the world is currently facing, uh, which is the threat of the Islamic State expansion, the Ebola crisis, and a new global financial crisis worse than 2008. Now, your presentation to this conference was titled, Which Way Australia? To Hell with London and Wall Street or to the Heavens with the BRICS? Well, this is a very important and strategic conference, Elisa, and I think um, the Schiller Institute, you know, is becoming a, a, a focus of people around the world who... In, from various nations who actually, how can we uh, stop the, the drive that's coming out of places like London and Wall Street to um, preserve their dominance in the world, preserve the Anglo-American dominance in the world a against the rise of countries like China, mm -hmm. right? And that thinking is going to end in a war because a country like China is not going to bow the knee and say, sorry, Your Majesty, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to stop growing. Sorry, Prince Philip for mm. having 1.4 billion people. Mm. They're not going to do that. Nor Russia. Right? Nor, uh, definitely not Russia. Um, and consequently, they're rallying other major countries to the cause. Brazil, India, um, South Africa, etc., and more around them. So, um, you know, the quality of discussion was not, it's not, this was not a discussion about how do we declare war on Britain and the United States. It was about how do we get the best people in Europe, the best people in America, the best people around the world to trump those vested interests inside those countries who want war, we're really up against a hard choice because economically, if we stick with the strategic alliances we have, London and Wall Street, who are, and I say London and Wall Street, you know, the politicians will think United States and, you know, um, Great Britain, but they are under the control of London and Wall Street. That's who we're sticking with. Mm. We are going down the gurgler fast. Right? And you can see that in, say, the financial system inquiry has just announced that whatever discussion they were even having about ring fencing a few months ago, that's now off the agenda. And they're just going to push ahead with a so-called reform that's going to give the banks carte blanche for everything. America, in this case, did overtly pressure us, but it's, but it, it's almost unnecessary. Mm. It's mm. axiomatic in Australia's minds. We've, we've got this British educated view that cannot break free of the ideology that, mm. that we've... You know, the way we've destroyed our economy, we would like to share that with China, with Asia now, right? Mm. Well, that's probably not going to fly over there. A very good pers um, uh, economist from India named Jay Sri Sengupta, who, was, who gave us a very good uh, perspective on what I India's potential is mm. now under people like Modi, the new president there. Mm. There were people from China representing the highest levels of China at this conference. There were people from Russia. There every were continent, from, Every fact, continent was yeah. represented, including us. Mm. But they did get this provision that if a bank is caught breaching the ring fence so that if the investment bank cowboys jump over the fence and start raiding the piggy banks of the savings division, right, if they're caught out doing that, then Glass-Steagall, a full Glass-Steagall, oh. will be applied to that bank straight away. Mm. That yeah. bank will be forced to split up. So that's very good. What's really disappointing, though, is... Even that ring fencing law, as bad as it is in the UK, doesn't start until 2019. Hmm. And there's a financial crash just around the corner. Yeah. And that we spoke to people um, who are very well connected in the financial system, and they agree with us. The next financial crash is roaring down on us now. That's driving the whole strategic perspective as well as economic policy. And Glass-Steagall cannot wait until, or even ring fencing cannot wait until 2019. No. Um, and so uh, what we were bringing was a sense that there's an international fight for this and that got people's attention, right? The international scale of this yeah. fight and hopefully that will bear fruit. Mm. Well, recently there was a fair day held at one of the most beautiful campuses here in Western Australia, UWA, and Greg Smith went along to take a look. G'day, we're at the Matilda Bay Rotary Club 
annual fair. It's a fantastic annual event and we're going to go and find some treasures. The fair's been running for about 16, 17 years now. It uh, is one of the main events of the Rotary Club of Matilda Bay. Uh, what we do here is as a partnership between the City of Subiaco, the University of WA, uh, and uh, particularly there, the Uni Camp for Kids. Um, and we give this opportunity. It's about 110 stalls here today. Uh, those uh, people are making arts and crafts and uh, selling them. Uh, they pay uh, a fee to come. Yeah. That uh, is a major fundraising event for the club and usually we raise about forty to $50,000 from the fair. That money is returned to the community. <laughs> I make handmade children's clothing. Yeah. Um, mostly I have girls' things here today because I just didn't get enough time to finish all okay, the boys' things. Okay, come on, show us one of your I girly do, things. Well, this is probably... Oh, the most uh, girly of them the, all. The most girly of them all. This is, this is uh, my I Love Ballet dress and it's uh, very popular with the little girls. Is that the, right? With a ballerina dress and the ribbons. That's with it. Well, and this is all um, handmade jewellery that I make. Yep. Um, all personalised with names, dates anniversaries, special quotes, anything you like. So what's that one got on it? So these are ladies had made with her two children's names, which are Zane and Baden. Um, you get to choose what font you like on there, your chain, and they're all personalised. So this one's got my family's name on it um, with our anniversary. Um, the sun bears and the moon bears and the sloth bears, and they each come from um, uh, different places in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and and around um, India as well. And Free the Bears um, uh, raises funds to go towards putting them in sanctuaries because there's a lot of bears that are used for bear paw soup and um, for the meat trade and a whole range of different um, horrible things. They're taken from their mother at a very young age. And um, yeah, and so the Free the Bears is looking at um, rescuing the really young bears and, and rehabilitating them and putting them in sanctuaries. So. So we've got a couple of uni camp for kids people here. So what's the story? Uh, so basically, uni camp for kids is helping out Rotary um, run the run and set up the craft fair. Uh, we do we help out the store holders and we also do the kids activities. So like the face painting and so and I've been yeah. practicing on yourself. Yeah, we have. Yes, yes. <laughs> or are you the kids? one? One of the kids painted my face. Yeah, so we actually have a few of our kids um, here today. They're helping out with the lemonade stall. So. Right. The Uni Camp for Kids, as you might know, uh, runs uh, over the summer camps for uh, children with, you know, with uh, underprivileged and with, um, you know, special needs, and and uh, they yeah. usually hold it at um, the at the one at Point Walter or somewhere oh, over there. There's not, a, a not recreation. Point Perrin. No, no, I don't know where they. Sometimes they move it around, but that's a great thing. So they'll get about fifteen thousand dollars from today. Uh, so all the students um, are leaders on the camps, and then. We have kids that we take, so they're the, the uni camp and, kids. And do you go down to Point Perrin? Is that yeah, exactly we do right. in summer. Yeah, we go down to Point Perrin. The three weeks of and, summer. Yeah. And, and they, they are the main uh, one this year, but we also give a, uh, money for other, other um, uh, charities in the local community. From the Matilda Bay Rotary Fair at UWA. Ciao. Well, that brings us to the end of tonight's episode of Undercurrent. Make sure you come on into the city and check out the Christmas decorations. Looks like plenty of them are up already. My name is Christy Mollica, and we'll catch you next week for another of the show that we make just for you here in Western Australia, Undercurrent.